My name is Dustin Heiner. I'm the founder of Master Passive Income. And right now we're going to be going through how to identify a profitable income property. Now, I've been investing in rental properties for uh, a very long time, uh, I don't think like, like 12 years now. And um, I started and I bought one property and then I bought another and kept buying more and more, made every mistake I possibly could. But uh, let me, let's go through the things that I've learned in my many years of, of investing in rental properties. So again, first, my name is Dustin Heiner. And I wanna give this quote that Andrew Carnegie said. He said 90% of all millionaires became so through owning real estate. Now, I would absolutely wholeheartedly agree with that. I've tried my luck at stock at the stock market. I, I did my research. I tried to figure out how to make money through the stock market. And every time I lost money, I was really good at, at buying high and selling low, which is absolutely not what you want to do. So I was really good at that. Anyway, so I went into real estate because I started realizing that I wanted to make monthly income and I wanted to earn money every, or sorry, make money every single month as opposed to earning money from a job. So let me show you a little bit about me. So that's uh, my, my wife and my lovely kids on the left-hand side. So a little bit about me. Again, I'm Dustin Heiner, the founder of Master Passive Income. I grew up in Fresno, California, right in the center. If you think north, south, east, and west of California, that's a very dead center of California. Um, great place to, to live and grow up. I currently live in Phoenix, Arizona, um, moved here to be closer to my wife's parents. Um, they're getting older and it'd be great to be around them, my kids to be around them. Um, a quick little thing, I moved here, I didn't actually need to find a job because all my rental properties bring in enough money where I could li literally live anywhere and we're, we're choosing Phoenix right now. So uh, married to my lovely wife, Melissa, uh, 12 years now. Um, praise the Lord and um, raising four super fun kiddos. They're, they're fantastic. They, they are a joy right now. They're actually at their grandparents' house. So you probably won't hear them running around in the background. Um, I've started many businesses, even a retail business where I had for open for four years and sold the business. So I, I love entrepreneurship. I love uh, business. Um, I began real investing in real estate, uh, in 2007, so just before the crash. So if you remember 2008, 2009, 2008 was going great, 2009 the crash hit and I was in, I just started buying properties then. So it wasn't the best time to buy properties because I was buying high. But um, anyways, in 2016, I actually quit my job uh, because I have enough income from my rental properties to, to live the life of my dreams. So also we love to travel all over the world. My family last year, we flew to, um, in March, we flew to Japan, did a six week vacation around Japan, um, traveled all, all through the South of, of America, uh, sorry, South in America through Texas and everything. And in fact, just in 20 days, we're gonna be going to Europe for six weeks, um, traveling all from uh, London or sort of England to Scotland, Ireland, uh, Netherlands, Germany, all that sort of stuff. So we love traveling, we love being together. But the greatest thing is with my rental properties, buying good income properties, I can actually do all this stuff remotely, as well as if you do it right, the business can run itself. You have other people run your business for you. So I literally don't need to be um, in my house or anywhere near, I could be in a, another part of the world and still get run my business. Okay, so that's a little bit about me. Let me show you also how I bought my first 19 properties. Now, this is how I did it. You might have different ways to, to do it. Um, this is how I do it. So um, I started buying really, really cheap properties. So in 2007, bought my first property um, for $17,000 cash. Took all of my wife and my uh, life savings and bought it for $17,000 cash. Um, it was in another state. So I lived in California, bought the house in Ohio and um, started renting it out immediately. And so uh, the good thing was back in 2007, I could refinance the property. So I refinanced the property, took out $15,000 because banks were just giving money away, took out $15,000. And then in October, bought property number two for $10,000. So I had a little money left over, but that rented for $550. So look, in just one year, I had $1,000 coming in. Minus expenses, I think we were probably um, pocketing about uh, seven to $800. Anyways, refinanced that property and took out another $20,000. And I, in April of 2008, bought my third property for $10,000 cash and kept renting. So I'm going to go through these really quick. Um, June bought another one, September bought another one. So in 2008, I bought, uh, let's see, one, two, three properties, four properties, then 2000, another one, five. So I kept, I just kept buying properties and here's a little funny thing. So, um, 
if you look at the property number seven and number six and seven, I actually bought that with a credit card. If you can imagine, uh, since these are cheaper priced uh, homes, I thought of any way to make money. So I actually took a, I had a uh, letter from a bank that said, hey, we're going to give you 0% interest on this. Sorry, it wasn't zero. It was like 0.75% interest on the life of the cash out balance. And they gave me a credit limit of $14,000. And I said, all right, that's that's cheap money. I'm going to buy properties. So I bought two properties with, the, with them and that made me $1,000 a month. So let's keep going through these. So March bought more, July bought more. As you can see, my my uh, the way I'm buying them is through um, or is with cash, but then also buying really inexpensive homes, really cheap homes. Now there's a lot of hassles to that come with with the cheap homes, which we could talk about the later. It's a whole another another lesson. But buying cheap homes, how to actually rent them right and make money and live off of them, um, it's a whole other story. So let's keep moving on. So. Um, in 2011, bought more properties, kept buying, buying more. And again, these are you're going to get these slides, so you can see if you want to kind of go through them. But I actually went through all of my HUD statements, all of my you know title closing, and actually got the dates and got exactly how much prices. So keep going through all these. And so I want to say uh, no, November 2015 was when I bought my um, my 19th property. And so obviously I've still continued to buy properties. And in fact, it just I want to say um, three weeks ago I just bought. Um, three single family homes and one duplex in all in one purchase from another investor who wanted to to sell and get out. It was a fantastic deal. It was cash down, seller financing. Um, anyways, great deal. So I could tell you more about that at some other time. So that's how I quit my job is after working that hard in just eight years, I had $9,500 in gross rents after all those properties. Um, every single month they were bringing in a total of $6,500 in monthly net profit. So $6,500 net monthly profit. I was talking to my wife and I said, hey, we're bringing us money and you know, I still have my job. I'd rather not work. And I asked her, you know, if I didn't work, how much money would we need to bring in in order to live, you know, with our mortgage, our food bills, you know, doctor bills, insurance, all that sort of stuff. And it turned out where I think we needed like $4,200. And so I thought, why am I still working? If I'm making way above that, why do I want to still slave away at a dead end job? So anyways, that was me in just eight years. I was able to, to um, uh, quit my job and I, now I, I solely invest. And I also am really passionate about teaching people because I get a lot of people asking me, how, how come you don't have a job? And I tell them about real, real estate and they ask, well, how do I do it? And I say, well, let me, let me show you. Anyways, okay, so I want to give you um, so, uh, basically teaching you the key to a profitable income property. So if you think about what income property is, it's something that brings money in every single month into your pocket, not taking money out of your pocket, like your personal residence. Well, you know, if you're, if you're on this webinar, you probably already know most of this stuff, but your personal residence does not put money in your pocket unless you're literally renting out every single room and trying to make a profit off of that. But if just you and your family are living there, you're paying your mortgage and that mortgage is uh, taking money out of your pocket. Well, the key to a profitable income property is that you're putting money into your pocket every single month. So let me give you the key here. The key is to buy good investments, not good properties. That is one of the main keys that you want to take away. If you listen to anything today, this is one of the best things you can learn is buy a good investment, not a good property. I mean, you could find a property that is um, takes $100,000 worth of work to fix it up. But if you buy it for $100,000, fix it up for $100,000 and it's worth $400,000, well, you made a profit as well as you could rent it for really cheap. All that to say, you don't want to look for the best properties. You don't want to look for one that you're going to move into. You're not going to, you don't want to look for one that you say, well, this one has nice drapes and nice shutters and you can look at the, how pretty the carpet is. Don't worry about any of that because you can change that. What your goal is to buy good investments. And in doing that, you're going to actually make money every single month. A good investment, and we'll talk about this in just a second, will make you money every single month. Okay, so let's look at the criteria for a profitable, profitable investment property, an income property or an investment property. Remember, we're getting good investments, not good properties. So let me ask you a question. Wouldn't it be good to buy a property that gives you the greatest rate of return? You know, you put your money down and how much money you get back, that's your rate of return. Gives you the greatest rate of return. 
Also, wouldn't it be great to buy a property that makes you money from the first day you buy it? Right when you buy it, you could rent it out and make money. Wouldn't that be great where you're making money uh, from the very first day? Also, another uh, when you want a property that the majority of renters want to live in, like they say, yes, I want to live in that, that property. Also, families desire to rent it. I'm going to tell you right now, my favorite tenants are families. I love families that move in there, you know, one, two, three, four, however many kids. But when they have kids, usually they live where their schools are and they live where they work. And when they have an anchor being a school and a, and a job, they don't move out of that home very often. And we know turnover, and when turnover is basically when a tenant moves out and you got to get somebody in there, that costs money. And I don't like that. I want to, I want to make as much money as I can, as least amount as expenses. So anyways, uh, families want to rent this type of property. Now, wouldn't it also be good to have a property that um, has the least amount of expenses coming out of your pocket? Because expenses take money out, income brings money in. You want to have as little amount of money coming out of your pocket. Also, it's less expensive to fix up. When you buy the property, you have less uh, money coming out of your pocket just to fix it up, getting it ready to rent. Also, costs less to maintain. So, you know, um, everything from taking care of the, the plumbing to electrical and all that sort of stuff, it costs less. What about, uh, wouldn't it be great to have a property that the majority of home, home buyers want to buy? You know, if you're saying, it's time for me to move out of this one, one um, rental property that I have, I'm gonna sell it because I have a better deal over here than maybe a multifamily, you know, I'm buying an apartment complex or whatever it might be. I want to sell this house, but wouldn't it be great to have a house that every buyer or all majority of the buyers want to buy? Well, let me give you the best type of property to buy when you're looking at single family homes. You want, you want to buy a single family home that's a cookie cutter type home. When I say cookie cutter, it's it's run of the mill, you know, any any type of property that is, um, you know, in a, in a suburb that is a uh, complex, not complex, sorry, that's not the right, right way to say it, but it's just in the neighborhood that is um, normal for every single person. So a cookie cutter home would be a three bedroom, two bathroom, two car garage, 1200 to 1400 square feet. Now this is your cookie cutter type home that as we went through the list, you're going to get everybody want to rent, everybody that is going to want to eventually buy a property. Um, there's a lot of less costs and expenses. So this is the cookie cutter type home. Um, I'm going to tell you that I bought homes that are like double this size and many more rooms and more bathrooms and it's very expensive and you don't get that much more money out of rent. So let me explain a little bit, a little bit more. The cookie cutter home, imagine you have less walls to paint. There's less square footage. There's less everything about a property that um, that's less expenses coming out of your pocket. Um, so less walls to paint. So fewer bathrooms to repair. You know, if you have a two bedroom, uh, sorry, three bedroom, two bathroom house that you have two toilets to fix. You have, you know, two just normal sinks to fix, two plumbing, uh, two bathtubs. But if you add a whole nother bathroom, a third bathroom in there, it literally does not raise, in my opinion, I've never seen it raise the value of my rent. Like I can't get more rent just because there's one extra bathroom. But what it does do is it gets many more expenses, more, you know, clogged toilets, more, just more problems uh, because I have an extra bathroom to repair. There's more plumbing, there's more electrical, there's more fixtures, all that sort of stuff. Also, less electrical problems. If you have fewer square footage, you have fewer lines of wires and 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 uh, light, light switches and all that sort of stuff and, and light fixtures, you have less electrical problems, less carpeting to replace, you know, just flooring, just you have less square footage in general of, you know, if it's a dollar square foot to put flooring down, well, if you have a 2,400 square foot um, house, just the, the, um, the cost of the materials alone is going to be $2,400 on top of how much they're going to cost to put it in. So fewer doors to fix, fewer windows to get broken and repair and replace. Um, a three bedroom, two bath, 2,400 square feet, two car garage is large enough for a family. Remember, we, we like families, or at least I, my opinion is I love having families in, in my um, properties. 
there's also a larger pool of renters there they this is a normal house that people really like to have a three bedroom two bath two car garage i'm gonna keep saying that because i'm gonna probably drill it in your head um, 12 to 12 1400 square feet also dollar for dollar the best return on your investment because if you buy a house that's that's four bedroom or five bedroom um two or three bath you're going to pay a lot more money but the amount of rent is only going to increase maybe by 50 to 100 200 at best you're not going to dramatically increase so the price of a three bedroom, two bath, two car garage, 1,200 to 1,400 square feet is gonna be lower and you're gonna get a good return for it in the rent. Also, you also have a larger pool of buyers, more people that would actually buy the property when it's time for you to get out. So it's all in all, the cookie cutter type home is the best, in my opinion, the best. I've done smaller, you know, if you have two bedrooms, you have less people that wanna rent it or less people that wanna buy it. If you have, um, you know, a 900 square feet, families don't like to fit, or they can't really fit or they don't like living in there. So let me give it to you one more time. So the cookie, type, cookie cutter type home is three bedroom, two bath, two car garage, 1200 to 1400 square feet. This is my, my experience has shown this is the way I make the most money. Okay, now let's jump into the criteria for a profitable investment property. So number one, cash flow from monthly rent. Now, if you get into, if you're already into it and, and if you're thinking about getting into it, the cash flow is the best way that you make money. Now we're gonna make money many different ways from the appreciation of value and all that we're getting into in just a second, but the cash flow is what's going to be putting money into your pocket. That's what I live on. That's what my family, that's how I feed my kids is the cash flow from the monthly rent. So when you buy your rental properties, you must buy them in such a way that you can earn cash flow from day one. You want to make sure that you can get a property and that you actually make money every single month. So, and basically, as you probably already know this, but I'm going to go through it. The rent minus expenses is your cash flow for the property rents minus ex expenses so rent how much money you're bringing in add up all your expenses everything if you have a property manager if you have utilities you got to pay for whatever it might be and even a mortgage you deduct that so let's just say round numbers rent fourteen hundred dollars a month from a tenant total expenses one thousand fifty dollars well your net profit would be three hundred fifty dollars coming into your pocket every single month wouldn't that be fantastic i mean my life was dramatically changed when i had 300 an extra my first property an extra 350 or 400 dollars a month my life was dramatically changed by that getting that first property it got me excited to get the next property and then get the next property after that so let me give you a pro tip only buy properties that make you 250 dollars or more every single month in my opinion these are they're not hard to find properties that make you $250 or more. But what happens is you're, if you go below that, you tend to um, start to lose money. And the reason why is the property is not going to be rented all year long, every single day of the year. You might have a turnover. You might even have an eviction. You might have a furnace that goes out. You basically, this is your profit that you can put towards the rest of uh, the rest of the year. And so imagine that if you're making $100 a month, well, after just $100 a month that you're bringing in, it's actually not going to make you enough money to pay for any expenses. Or if you have an eviction, you know, if you have one, uh, if you have one time where you don't have anybody that is in the, the property, if you have a mortgage, that mortgage is going to cost you $1,000, $1,200. Well, that eats up a lot of your profit right then and there. So all that to say, you your pro tip I'm going to give you is you want to buy a property that has $250 or more every single month. All right, so number two, your um, criteria for a profitable investment property is you want equity in the property. You don't want to lose money. You want to make money every single month. So, um, sorry, with equity. So equity in the property is valued by how much you can sell the property for minus how much you owe on the property. So the market value being $200,000, the amount owed is $150,000, the equity you have in the property is $50,000. Now that's equity that's, it's not money in your pocket, but what I did when I bought my first property, I actually refinanced it, if you remember that list, refinanced it, pulled the money out so then I could then buy a property and I could then buy another property after that. So all that to say, equity in the property is one of the best ways for you to be able to um, increase the value of your home 
as well as use that money to buy more properties. Now, let me also give you a pro tip. A pro tip, you make your money when you buy the property on, on a purchase of a property. You make your money when you buy, you realize your money when you sell the property. That makes sense. So when you buy the property, buying the property is, is really when you capture all that equity, you capture the buying low and selling high, just like in the stock market. So you realize the, your money when you sell it. So if you sell it for 100,000 more than you bought it for, that's when you actually put that money in your pocket. All right, so let's move on to the next one. So number three, criteria for a profitable investment property. Location, location, location. Now, we've all heard this saying, right? If we're thinking about an investment property, an income property, the criteria for a, a, a profitable investment property, well, if you've heard this the saying, I'm going to say absolutely forget that. This is my own personal opinion and my experience after many years of buying many properties. I have properties all over the country. Um, I, I have properties that I, when I was in California, I started buying in Ohio and Texas and Arizona. And so I just started buying properties outside of California because it's really expensive. And I started realizing it's not about location. And here's the reason why. So forget about location, location, location. We're not realtors. We're, we're not, we're not um, homeowners when we buy our investment properties. We're not looking to use this as a place to live in. And we're not looking at it as a place to flip. This is something that we're going to be making every money every single month. We're investors in rental properties. We're not looking to flip a property. We're not looking to live in it. So the, the location only matters where no one will live. Like if you're going to buy a home in, Antar in the Antarctic where nobody would literally want to rent that property, well, that'll be a waste of money. But if you're going to buy a property that, let's say, you know, people might think, well, why would anybody want to live in Fresno? Well, there sure are people that live in Fresno. Or I have properties in um, Ohio that there are some like um, Akron, Youngstown, Cleveland, um, Border, uh, Borderman, a lot of different cities that people might say, well, why would anybody want to live there? Well, there are people living there. And as long as there are people living there, you're going to be able to make money as long as you buy the property right. So again, location, location, location. I, my opinion is forget that. As long as you can make money every single month, everybody, literally every single person, it's one of the needs. They need to have a place to live. So rule of thumb for location, your pro tip is never buy a property where you will not make money the first day you own the property. So some people have said, well, I'm going to buy this property and in 10 years, it's going to appreciate and that's when I'm going to make my money. Well, that's all well and good, but I'm an investor. I like having money come in my pocket every single month. So I'm not going to go through with that. Um, I'm going to actually make sure I buy and get money from the very first day I buy it. Okay. Criteria number four is forced appreciation. So find properties that need work so you can increase the value. So do th you can do things like um, that will increase the value of your home, like paint, flooring, landscaping, new countertops, et cetera. So you want to be able to force the appreciation of the value to go up. So give you an example, market value of $120,000. Then you put money into the property. So rehab cost be $15,000. Well, you're looking at your total cost of everything after said and done is $135. Sorry, $135,000, I apologize for that. $135,000. Well, after the repairs, your value, the ARV after repair value is $165,000, which would be an increased value of $30,000. Now, if you've seen any of those home flipping shows on HGTV or you know any other um, TV, you can understand the, the idea that you, you buy low, fix it up, get the value higher, and then make your money. Well, this is a great way for us to increase the value so we can pull more money out refinance the property, pull more money out, and then put that money into a new property, a brand new property that makes us even more money. I've done this many, many times. Okay, so this is forced appreciation. Also, let me give you another pro tip. You, you wanna buy good investments. Don't buy the best house on the street. When I say that is, you know, you look on the street or the general neighborhood, if you're buying the very, very best house on the street, well, the, the rents aren't going to be that much, that much greater. Like if it's completely remodeled, it's a fantastic home, looks terrific, but every other home in the area doesn't look that like it. It's not as good. It's not as nice, but you paid a lot of money for it. You may have paid a lot of money for it. Well, your rent is, is only going to be what it's like the next door or the next door after that. It It's only in a, in a certain radius that your rents are going to be. So my opinion is don't buy the best house on the street, but because we have forced appreciation, we can fix it up to, to look really nice, get the value up. So you can put your sweat into it, or my opinion, I love buy or hiring contractors and hand him in and have them do all the work while I go and you know go on vacation. Okay, so let's go to the next one. 
Criteria number five, rentability. So a rental property is only good if you can rent it to a paying tenant. Obviously, you know, if you buy, you know, back in, was it 2009, where they couldn't give away um, the properties in Detroit, the homes in Detroit, they literally could not give it away. Um, nobody would actually rent there. So that might not be the best. It, it very well, it could. I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying you want to find a property that you will get a paying tenant from day one. So how to find good areas. So how do you find good areas that have rentable um, uh, properties that tenants want to rent? Well, I invest all over the country and this is what I do, is I talk to property managers, realtors, inspectors, handymen, basically anybody, uh, and also obviously other investors, anybody about the area. Because in my area where I currently live, I know about it. But you know, if I'm, if I'm looking at Idaho, I wanna buy a house in Idaho, um, and I've never been there, well, then I need to talk to other people. So you find good areas, but your number one person that you could talk to are number one and number two. Your number one person, your property manager, number two would be your realtor. And I would say get a, an investing realtor, one that knows how to invest, um, that knows how to invest for cash flow, not just a realtor that not, nothing against somebody has a second job, but you know it could be a teacher that needs to make extra money, which good for them. They become a realtor and they sell homes, but that's great. I don't want somebody that sells homes. I don't care about the drapes or the shutters. I care about how much money I'm gonna make every single month. Um, so they're doing a great job making money, uh, more money for them. But I look for realtors that are selling homes that knows what it's like to have a real, real estate business. But here's your number one person to talk to, property managers. I've gone into areas where I've started talking to property managers. I say, so what about this area? Those prices of those homes are pretty inexpensive. You know, What about those? And they'll say, I literally, this is what the property manager has told me. I literally will not manage any properties in there. The crime is bad. This is bad. Something happens or, you know, I just won't do in there because it's not worth my time. It's not worth me getting hurt or whatever it might be. So talk to property managers to see which areas are the best for rentability. All right. Criteria six for a profitable investment property. Clientele. Now, the rent range for the property, um, it varies. So the high, let's just give you an example. If you have a high end in one certain area, the high end of the rent for a three bedroom, two member cookie cutter, three bedroom, two um, bathroom, um, two car garage, 1,200, 1,400 square feet. If you have that, you have the high end of $1,400, a middle end, uh, middle range of $1,200 and a low end of $1,000. Now, if you go like to Zillow.com or you know, if you try to figure out what type of rent, if you talk to a, a realtor, a property manager, they say, well, we could, you know, the high end is probably gonna be 1,400, low end, you know, 1,100, maybe $1,000. So the rent range for a normal property can fluctuate, I'd say anywhere from a thousand or $400 to $200, something like that. Give this example, $1,400 to $1,000 in difference. So the upper classes, so your clientele, if they're, they're upper class or you know, they have a little more affluence or more money, um, you have higher end rents can be charged in these areas. And this is from my own personal experience because the properties, the cheaper homes that I bought that were $10,000, this is a lower class um, uh, area where it's, it's really depressed market, which I'll get to in a second. But in upper class where I do I also have properties where it's upper class, you get higher end rents can be charged in these areas. So you look at your clientele and see how you can actually charge. Now, also middle class, if you go to a general middle class, like in, I would say in the middle of Phoenix, there's more middle class people in the middle of Phoenix. Um, so you get middle range rents can be charged. So about $1,200 um, for this one particular property. But if you go to the lower class, it might be um, uh, even $1,000. So a lower end of rent spectrum can be charged. So keep this in mind because um, if you charge middle class rents for a lower class area, you're gonna find lower class people move in, and this is my own personal experience, they're gonna move in, but they're gonna move out within six months or a year. They're gonna find someplace that's cheaper. For them, and I, I completely understand it, if, 50, if they could save $50 a month on their rent, they're gonna move. And you don't want them to move. You wanna lower the amount of um, time that you have of a turn turnover. So what I do, is wherever I'm renting, I look at my clientele and also figure out how much I can rent from a property. If a property manager says you can rent from $1,400 to $1,000 or $1,000 to $1,400, I look at the area and see what type of clientele and I adjust accordingly. Because the last thing I want is to be in a low end thinking and buying a property, thinking I'm gonna rent it for $1,400, but only be able to get $1,000 out of it. So that's another one for you. Um, here, let me give you another pro tip, always, 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 now this is for clientele. 
And not just because it's with AAOA, but my own personal experience, I've been burned many times. Always, 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 let me do that one more time. Always, always, always run a background check, um, a, a eviction check, credit check, background check. Always, 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 let me give you an example. So um, I was really irritated how I kept having turnover. I kept having people having to evict them. I mean, you know, these lower, um, lower class um, areas where it's much more depressed market. There was a lot of turnover. And I started realizing I'm not doing a background check on these people. And so I started doing background checks and I started watching to see what type of people would actually be a good tenant to um, be in my property. And so anyways, I, I got one background check come back that came back to me. The application from the tenant looked fantastic. She had, um, you know, said she had great um, employment, great living history, all that sort of stuff. So the background check or sorry, the application that she filled out and gave me looked fantastic. Well, I ran a background check and I'll give to tell you this in this one area, my property manager just said, well, these tenants are not going to pay for a background check. So you can't force them or, you know, you're just not going to get anybody to to apply if you force them to pay for it. And so I just paid for it myself because I got tired. I started th thinking, well, a background check is going to cost me thirty, forty dollars. Well, if it saves me one eviction, an eviction might be fifteen hundred to two thousand or twenty five hundred dollars. Thirty five hundred dollars to save me one eviction is well worth it. So what I did was I ran a background check on this lady, and in three years she had four evictions on her record. I was blown away. I said, I'm not going to be the fifth eviction. But I'm going to move on. I found somebody else. So always, always, always do a background check. I I can't stress that enough. All right. So number seven. Crime. So criteria for looking for profitable investment property. Crime is, is definitely a big one. Um, so in with low crime areas, which I would say every part of the country has crime, literally every, you're not going to get one that has no crime, you're gonna, but you're going to get um, some more than others. So lower, low turnover, lower turnover, lower amount of evictions. So like, you know, with turnover, somebody would move out and give you the keys with low crime and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm moving out. Um, but you, you would maybe have evictions, but you have a lot less less problem tenants, less break-ins, less repairs on the property. This is just how it works out. It's, it's sad, but that's just the way it works out. Um, crime. So the people that, that live in this, the higher crime area that are, sad, that are more moderate, there would be more turnovers, uh, more evictions uh, that, that are likely. Um, they also have more, you'll also have more problem tenants, which would be a bummer, but in more problem tenants, you have a few break-ins, not a lot, but you have a few break-ins, um, moderate repairs on the property because of break-ins, because of the type of tenants you're going to have in there. Now, here's um, here's the high end, high turnover. So you're going to get people turning over maybe once a year um, at, at best. I mean, you might get somebody that's in there for five years, but that's a rarity. You know, with high turnover, you get a lot more turn or high crime, you get a lot more turnover. Evictions are high. They're not willing to just give you the keys and walk out. They're going to stick in there until you evict them. Trust me, I've been there um, many times. So more problem tenants, many break-ins, like many break-ins, like when it's not rented, you're going to have somebody break in and actually take, steal the copper. I've had this many times, steal the copper out of the basement and recycle it, make, you know, five bucks, but it cost me $300 to replace it and re repair it. So break-ins, high repairs needed on the property. So what I would tell you is that um, you, you just look at the the crime rate for the area. You could, there's many different ways. I'm not going to get into how you could figure that out, but talk to your property manager, talk to realtors. Now, here's something I'm, um, I want to give you. Uh, let me jump back. So here's a pro tip. I didn't have a slide for it, but a pro tip is Try to look at and try to understand how the crime is moving. Back 10 years, 12 years ago, or however long I started, when I started investing, um, a, a few houses that I bought were in a decent area. But over 10 years, the crime has now moved to where my area that was you know, low to moderate is now moderate to high. And once one street in particular is high crime. And I'm really obviously um, sad about that. I'd like to see it. I'm trying to help people out. Anyways, all that, story, long story short, um, try to anticipate where it's going to move to and keep that in mind because if it moves to where now your place that was low is now moderate or now was moderate and now high your rents are going to decrease and so that's going to eat into your your profits all right next one the eighth criteria is property taxes oh this is 
irritates me bad. So property taxes are not standard across the country. Every state has different laws and rates. Every county has different laws and rates. And every city has different laws and rates. So verify all the taxes you will encounter before you buy the property. So you want to get all your expenses all, all put together before you actually buy the property so you know how much, as best you can, your expenses are going to be. I'm going to give you an example. So, um, Everywhere I've invested, I'm gonna say everywhere, the majority of the places I've invested, there's county taxes. And the county taxes are the most money. And um, there, few, very few places have actually had city taxes. Well, in uh, so I bought a house in Houston and I checked out the county taxes. I'm like, great, county taxes are, I don't know, I think it was like $1,300 a, a year. I was like, that's not bad. Okay, I'm gonna make a, a lot of money on this property. I'm gonna make like you know $500 a month, $600 a month um, in passive income. And then I get, once I, I buy the house, I see now I get a letter that there is now there's also city taxes of like twenty five hundred dollars a year. My jaw hit the ground. I could not believe I'm laughing now because, you know, uh, I actually still make money. I think I make like three hundred dollars a month from it. But it's so irritating that I actually had city taxes that were dramatically like almost double, probably double what it was for the county. All that to say, verify all the taxes, look everywhere. I wish I would have done this before I bought this property. I would have uh, you know, done some different things. All right, let's move on. Um, oh, sorry, last thing. Make sure they are in your numbers before you buy the property. You know, All your expenses, meaning taxes included. All right, so nine. So area specifics. This is another way to figure out the, the, um, if your property is going to be profitable or not. So the job market, is the job market, are there jobs coming in or going out of the area? If they're going out of the area, you're losing money. There's less pool of tenants that would, that less people that have jobs and that less pool of tenants, which makes values go down of rent because less people have jobs to pay rent. Um, so, so demand is, is lower. And so you have less rent. Also, your city, county, and state economy. Like, how is the economy in in the cer certain area? It could be city, county, or state. Look at that. Um, also, the schools, the amenities. Like, if there's, well, let me jump back to school. So, we love to rent to school, or sorry, to families, and families love schools that have good schools for the kids. They obviously want the best for the kids. So, schools are, are a, a very, very big criteria. Like, in uh, Phoenix, where I live, there's a few res uh, uh, retirement communities that there would not be any families because there's literally no schools. They don't even pay taxes for schools because there's literally no schools in those cities. So keep that in mind. You want to look at the schools in the area. Amenities as well, like Disneyland, the beach or the mountains, sports teams in the area. Like I, I live um, in, in Phoenix where we have a lot of sports teams like the the Cardinals, that the football team, the Car Cardinals are here. Um, you also have um, spring, spring ball where all baseball teams come in here and play because it's beautiful weather right now. Anyways, it's fantastic outside. Hopefully you're not where it's snowing. But uh, anyways, so look for amenities and places like Disneyland or on the beach or the mountain. You might even be able to use... Um, um, Airbnb or something like that so that you can make even more money. So look at the amenities so you can see how you can actually adjust how much rent comes in. Also, na also natural disasters. Again, I'm going to give you, um, uh, so hurricanes and earthquakes, a personal thing. So in the area that I invest in, in Houston, obviously we know this last year we had a hurricane that went through there. Praise the Lord, my house did not get flooded, but it got so close that it was like literally down the street and the tenants saw the water getting closer and closer and closer. So keep that in mind because you may need to buy hurricane insurance. Like in Houston, my area did not, it's not required but other areas, it's absolutely required to buy hurricane insurance. Or they could be, you know, in California, the San Andreas Fault earthquake insurance you might need. Okay, so let me recap. Monthly cash flow, equity capture, location, 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 and cross that out. It only matters if nobody's going to rent there or nobody's going to live there because everybody needs a place to live. Forced appreciation, rentability, clientele, property taxes, and area specific. So these are the things that you want to look for when you're buying a property. And 